thank you, Ariel and Harry and Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation and the women of NoHo. This is a really um, fun way to spend an evening um, in normal terms. And tonight it's even more special. Um, I hope, I'm, I'm so grateful to everybody who's joining us, although I can't see any of you and um, I'm just gonna trust you're there. Um, I hope you're all as okay as possible. And um, I was just realizing that our our gathering tonight is gonna run straight through seven o'clock. So if you are in New York City and you wanna pause to clap out your window for all essential workers, especially healthcare workers, given the nature of what we're talking about tonight, um, please go do that. I'm gonna keep talking because I'm not gonna remember to notice when it's seven o'clock, but please go do that and come back and um, clap for me too. Uh, Cause I wish I wasn't there, I was clapping with you. Um, okay, so here we have Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell. Um, if you are familiar with that name at all, you probably have only heard of Elizabeth, um, and you probably think of the phrase first woman doctor when you hear um, the name uh, as pictured in this um, book for young women in the 1940s. Elizabeth Blackwell, first woman doctor. She was indeed the first woman in America to receive a medical degree in 1849. Her sister, Emily, who was five years younger, um, followed in her footsteps and became the third woman doctor in America. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell really set out to prove a point um, more than anything else. She believed that it was her role to help change the world rather than um, heal individual people. She was a bit of a misanthrope. She didn't really like people, but she loved humanity. Um, so the idea of, um, of demonstrating to the world that a woman could be a doctor was the point she wanted to make. Um, this attitude combined with the extraordinary challenges of doing medicine as a woman in 1849 and going forward um, oriented her eventually more toward public health than private medicine. Um, her sister Emily kind of went in a different direction and we'll see how that unfolded. I'm with you tonight because I've just finished writing a biography of the two of them. It's gonna be called The Doctors Blackwell and it will be published by W.W. Norton in January in time for Elizabeth's 200th birthday in, uh, on February 3rd, 2021. Um, given the state of the world at the moment, Village Preservation um, suggested kindly that we didn't need to wait until 2021 to engage with a story that has real resonance now. Um, we are all suddenly unwilling participants in the largest public health project of all time, I think it's probably safe to say. Um, public health as we know it really began to emerge just at the time when the Blackwell sisters were coming into their careers. Uh, it began just as the Industrial Revolution and urbanization was decreasing the quality of life in growing cities. Um, the idea of people mobilizing to make life healthier was just beginning. Um, and this merging of that idea with the beginnings of their careers was formative for both of them. Um, so tonight I'm going to tell you the an abbreviated version of the Blackwell story with particular attention to the themes of public health and also a few stops in Greenwich Village, of course. Um, so since it's in the title of the talk, let's start with the infirmary building on Bleecker Street. Um, there it is on the left in a drawing that shows as, as it originally was. It was built in 1823. It was built for the Roosevelt family, the branch that eventually spawned Franklin Delano. Um, uh, you see it on the right, as it is today, the corner of Bleecker and Crosby. Um, in 2018, uh, Village Preservation added this building to their social justice map. And in honor of that, they installed this plaque. Um, let me read it to you. The site of Elizabeth Blackwell's Infirmary for Women and Children. In this building, the first female doctor in America, Elizabeth Blackwell, established the first hospital for staffed and run by women. The New York Infirmary for Women and Children opened in, on May 12th, 1857, a date which was also the birthday of Blackwell's friend and collaborator, Florence Nightingale. Groundbreaking at the time, the hospital provided free medical care for indigent women and children and offered clinical experience and instruction for women determined to expand their skills as physicians. And they unveiled it on a beautiful evening um, 
in May 2018. Uh, there was a great crowd. Um, that's me with Jane Carey Blackwell Bloomfield. She is Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell's great, great, great niece, I believe. Um, a wonderful person who has been enormously helpful to my work. And I believe she is with us tonight, along with her sister and some of her cousins. So we actually have real Blackwells with us, which is amazing. Thank you. Um, anyway, um, as a plaque, that is, a, is an excellent plaque. It's informative. Um, but plaques are funny things. They are impossible, even though they're essential. They are tiny reminders of larger stories. And if they make you pause on the sidewalk and think about something new, they're working. But by definition, they are terribly incomplete. Um, and that evening of this celebration of this plaque was really kind of a crystallizing moment for me and my work on this story. Um, as people walked away into the dusk, um, they were very they clearly beaming with pride at having participated in this piece of history. But a lot of them I knew had an image in their heads that looked sort of like this from the jacket of that book I showed you. You know, a slim, saintly woman bending solicitously over a grateful patient with her stethoscope. Um, and that's sort of the image that pops into everybody's head when you think of a 19th century woman doctor. But it's not really relevant to who Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell were. Um, even the stethoscope in 1857 would have been uh, not quite right. Most doctors working in the 1850s were using this kind of stethoscope still. So it was an evening that both made me excited to tell this story and eager to tell it in all of its messy completeness, the stuff that didn't fit on the plaque. So I'm gonna tell it sort of quickly, but with particular attention to public health. Um, the story starts in Bristol, England, uh, where the Blackwells began. Um, their father, Samuel Blackwell, was a paradox. He was a sugar refiner and an abolitionist. Got to think about that one for a second. Um, he had nine children, and he offered his five daughters the same education as his four sons. Um, he moved the whole family to America in 1832 in search of the idea of making sugar out of sugar beets instead of sugar cane without the use of slave labor, because that was the other part of what he believed. Um, he got them to New York in 1832 and then all the way out to the Wild West, Cincinnati, in 1838. Cincinnati then being a small town on the very edge of civilization. And four months after he reached Cincinnati with his nine children and his wife, he died broke. Um, he left his daughters with the lasting impression that a husband was no guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. Um, this building in Bristol is one that I visited. It's in a declining neighborhood, but still honored with another plaque. Um, Elizabeth, the third child and the third daughter, was born in 1821. She was voraciously brilliant, um, socially quite awkward, blessed with a healthy sense of her own self-worth. Uh, she really thought of herself as someone who could be important um, in the world. She admired Margaret Fuller, the famous editor and journalist, member of the Transcendentalist Circle, who in the 1840s was the author of a huge bestseller called Woman in the 19th Century. Uh, and that was a book in which Fuller argued that humanity would not rise to a new higher level of enlightenment until women claimed their own abilities and proved that they had the same ability to be anything that men could be. Women could be sea captains, they could be anything. Um, and Elizabeth Blackwell was kind of captivated by this idea and she wanted to be the kind of woman whose life proved Fuller's point about what women could do. So how to prove that point? Well, medicine is what she chose, and it wasn't an obvious choice. First of all, it wasn't an obvious choice for Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, she tended to equate sickness with weakness. When she got sick, she made sure nobody knew because it was embarrassing. Um, she thought bodily functions were disgusting. And medicine itself was going, under a, going through a process of redefinition, both scientifically and institutionally in the middle of the 19th century. Um, to this point, medicine had medical professionals weren't professionals, they were tradespeople. They were medicine was the work of midwives and barber surgeons. Um, now, increasingly, as medical schools started to come to the United States and be founded there, 
increasingly medicine was a profession, a profession of men, not women, um, with a credential that was a medical degree that you earned at a medical school, um, rather than the more sort of ambiguous apprenticeship system that had existed before. But paradoxically, even as the medical profession was squeezing out women, it was suddenly a little easier to prove a point as a woman, because if you found your way to a medical school as a woman, took the courses, studied the subjects, passed the exams, who could say that you weren't as uh, capable a doctor as any man? So Elizabeth fixed on medicine as a way to prove her point. It was a very calculated decision. Uh, so at the age of 26, she won herself a place at a tiny rural medical college after many, many rejections uh, at Geneva Medical College. Uh, this is the building which no longer stands in Geneva, New York. Uh, Geneva, Geneva College is now uh, known as Hobart and William Smith Colleges. Uh, still there, still a lovely, lovely institution. Um, Elizabeth won this place sort of by accident, but that's another story which you'll have to read about. Um, and she graduated at the top of her class in 1849. Now, medical school in the mid-1840s was um, nothing like what it is today. It was not a rigorous thing. You went to medical school if you weren't smart enough to study the law. Um, and medical school entailed two 16-week terms taken in two successive years. They were identical. You studied the same thing twice over. And in the middle, during the summer, you were expected to go off and find something to do that would increase your practical experience. So in between her two terms at Geneva Medical College, Elizabeth Blackwell went to Philadelphia and found her way to Blockley Alms House, um, which at that time was the oldest uh, public municipal uh, hospital in America. It was essentially a warehouse for the destitute, the dying, and the insane. Um, if you crossed the Schuylkill River from Philadelphia to Blackley Alms House, there was a very slim chance that you were ever coming back. Um, and it was Elizabeth's first exposure to actual patients and um, the beginning of the connection that she could make between poverty and disease. Um, her room in the Alms House, where she lived for several months, was right off the female syphilis ward. Uh, syphilis in 1848 was an especially horrifying thing in the age before antibiotics. People with late stage syphilis, um, in addition to having genital sores, also had necrotic lesions that ate away at their skull, at their face. Um, there was a condition called saddle nose, which was characteristic of late stage syphilitics in which the bridge of your nose collapsed. Um, that profile announced to the world that you had late stage syphilis. Um, but like many in the age before germ theory, like most in that age, um, Elizabeth did not understand a connection between germs, between microbes and disease. Um, the prevailing wisdom said that a disease was caused, venereal disease was caused by licentious behavior, wickedness. Uh, if you were a bad person, you were more likely to get syphilis. Um, so that was a, an early formative influence. Um, the other thing she learned at Blockley was her own intuition regarding hygiene. She was learning that hospitals were really not healthy places. Blockley was a great place to learn about illness, but it wasn't a great place to learn about healing. Uh, people didn't get better there because it was a place where diseases seemed to gather. Um, here she is writing to her older sister, Marion, upon arrival at Blockley Owens House. I am not afraid myself of sickness, but it is very certain if I should be ill, none of their nostrums would go down my uncontaminated throat. I should trust to fresh air, cold water, and nature, and live or die as the Almighty pleases. So she had an intuitive sense that um, medicine could do more harm than good in, in, the, in the form that it took in the 1840s. Um, coincidentally, right around the same time, only a year earlier, a Viennese physician named Ignaz Semmelweis had made a connection uh, in, in his hospital. He had noticed that on the wards um, 
where male doctors were attending to laboring mothers, there was a much higher rate of childbed fever than on the wards where just the midwives were looking after them. And what he discovered was that there was some connection between the morgue, where the doctors were doing autopsies, um, and not washing their hands before they plunged them in to help a laboring mother deliver a baby. Those mothers were dying more. So he ordered all the men in the hospital who were doing autopsies to wash their hands before they entered the labor and delivery ward, and the mortality rate plummeted. Um, it was a very clear connection between hygiene and health. Um, however, the world did not hail Ignat Semmelweis. His colleagues mocked him because they were deeply offended that he would suggest that their behavior was killing their patients. Um, Semmelweis died in, in an insane asylum, forgotten, still professing his, his connection that he had discovered. Um, but he, he died anonymous. Uh, Elizabeth would not have laughed at the, in, the insights that he had gathered in the hospital. They were very much in line with her own intuition. Of course, Semmelweis had the last laugh because last month he was the Google Doodle um, as we all started to focus more on how much and how long we wash our hands. Um, at Blockley, she also learned a lot about epidemic disease. Um, in the year prior to her arrival there, um, shiploads of immigrants from the Great Famine in Ireland had begun to arrive, um, bringing with them what was called ship fever or typhus, epidemic typhus. Um, and because she needed to write a thesis as part of her graduation from medical school, she decided to write about ship fever as she observed it at Blockley Alms House. This is the manuscript. Uh, she writes, the summer of 1847 was distinguished by the epidemic brought to our seaport towns through the means of the crowded emigrant ships, which arrived in great numbers from Europe. Our hospitals were filled to overflowing with patients in every stage of the disease. Many died in the receiving wards. Many more only entered the hospital wards to prove the inefficacy of the resources of the medical art. Um, this passage is horrifyingly resonant right now. Um, Elizabeth eventually published her thesis um, upon her graduation at the top of her class from Geneva College in 1849 in the Buffalo Medical Journal. This was her first piece of published writing on public health. But again, she could only use the conventional wisdom of the day. Nothing was known about the fact that typhus was transmitted by body lice. Um, all that Elizabeth knew was that um, perhaps it was the fear felt by these emigrants, these wretched refugees um, in steerage on these crowded ships, perhaps fear predisposed to disease and the stress of their flight had made them ill. Um, this, again, was formative for her and throughout her career, um, she really had this, this sense that emotional or moral weakness could make you vulnerable to illness. It was a key part of her attraction to public health, this idea that if people could be nobler, they could adopt better habits and live better, they would then be healthier. Um, anyway, she graduated from Geneva College in 1849. That's the spot in Geneva, New York, where the medical building used to stand, on Lake, on Seneca Lake. Um, and because uh, medical school was a very sketchy kind of training, you, you rarely actually touched a patient, you spent a lot of time watching in a lecture hall. Um, graduation from medical school had nothing to do with being a good doctor. She needed more training. So off she went to Paris, Paris then being a, a, a mecca of medical education, um, inexpensive state-run and very fine education, often more at the bedside than in the lecture hall. Except none of it was available to Elizabeth because she was a woman and she refused to dress in drag and disguise herself as a man because she wanted the world to witness that a woman could be a competent doctor, right? If she did it in disguise, it wouldn't count. She needed to remain a woman but still get this training. So she found her way to the only place that where her gender was actually an advantage. This was La Maternité, which was the um, most sort of central municipal maternity hospital in France. Um, young women from all over the country would come there to train to be midwives. And so even though Elizabeth at this point had a medical degree, she became a student again and lived in this converted convent. 
uh, for a crash course in obstetrics among the poor. Because again, if you were delivering a baby in a hospital, it meant you didn't have any money or, or any place else to go. Um, at La Maternité, she had a horrifying encounter with the convergence of poverty and disease um, in a very personal way. Um, many of the women who were delivering there would have been infected with sexually transmitted diseases, among them gonorrhea. And when a woman with gonorrhea gave birth, often the baby would have an infection called gonorrheal conjunctivitis, an eye infection caused by the mother's disease. Elizabeth was tending to one of these infants early one morning, um, syringing uh, its eye to wash the infection away when some of the washing liquid splashed into her own face and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis, which today is not such a big deal. Um, antibiotics take care of it fairly easily, but in 1849, it was catastrophic and she lost her left eye. Um, being Elizabeth Blackwell, part of why I admire her enough to write a book about her, um, this did not tell her to pack up and go home. She managed to recover, uh, was fitted for a glass eye, and continued to London to continue her training. Um, she was an extraordinary person. This is a picture of her circa a little bit, a few years later than that, but if you squint at it really hard, you can see that one of her eye sockets is slightly different than the other. Um, quite something. She never really acknowledged that she only had one eye. She just forged ahead. Um, but it did reorient her even more strongly toward public health work, because now with one eye, the option of doing surgery was really not available to her anymore. And even reading close work with the one good eye was tiring. So even more now, she became someone who was reading and writing and talking about medicine more than actually practicing it. Um, in London, she did some training at another big, venerable public hospital, St. Bartholomew's, the oldest in London, um, and became the colleague and uh, student of illustrious doctors in Britain. Um, but the most important contact she made while living in London in 1851 was with Florence Nightingale. Uh, they were introduced by mutual friends, and were instantly passionately fascinated with each other. They each had something that the other envied deeply. Um, Florence Nightingale was wealthy, well-connected, well-traveled, all things that Elizabeth Blackwell was not. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell, meanwhile, was independently pursuing a medical career instead of marriage. Um, Florence Nightingale's family was wishing very much that she would settle down and get married, Elizabeth was wishing very much that she had as much money as the Nightingales. So they were very curious about each other and they shared this great passion for the idea that hygiene was vitally important to humanity. Um, so at first their communion was instant and, and profound and ecstatic. Uh, and then they discovered a difference of opinion that sort of came permanently between them for the rest of their lives, which was that Florence Nightingale really believed that the role of a woman leading in the health field was to promote the training of nurses. That was what she wanted to do. She wanted to become a nurse and she wanted to train nurses because she really believed that doctors mostly got in the way. <laughs> she thought that if um, nurses could have a freer hand to just allow nature to heal, without the interference of doctors and their medicines, which often had worse side effects, um, everybody would be better off. Um, Elizabeth, meanwhile, was insistent that a woman had a right to be a doctor uh, and the world needed to recognize that. Uh, Florence Nightingale wanted to train legions of women to be nurses and didn't believe that pouring resources into training just a few talented women to be doctors, she didn't think that was the right road. Uh, and they ended up agreeing to disagree for the rest of their lives. Um, Elizabeth returned to New York after all of this in 1852 and settled initially uh, in, in this building uh, at 11th Street and University Place. This is actually the original building, uh, although it looks very modern now. Um, she had her training complete, she had a degree, she had testimonials from prominent doctors, but what she didn't have was any patience, partly because the idea of a woman doctor, the, the very phrase female physician, did not in 1852 mean what Elizabeth meant by it. 
Elizabeth meant, I'm a doctor, I just happen to be a woman. Most people in New York at that point who heard the phrase female, female physician thought abortionist, somebody who worked in the shadows outside of the law, doing something that was morally questionable. Um, most people indelibly associated that idea with that whole area. Um, so Elizabeth had a lot to overcome and she had no patience at all. Um, she spent a lot of time waiting in her examining rooms for people who did not come. Um, here's another photograph that masks her injured eye. Um, so she hit upon an idea if she wasn't going, if people weren't going to entrust themselves to her care personally, perhaps what she needed to do was create an institution that could, people could support in a less personal way with their money instead of their, their, their health. Um, and so she founded a tiny dispensary, a dispensary in those days. This is um, a dispensary that the, the building still stands. This is the Northern Dispensary at Waverly Place. This is not the one she founded. Um, but at that point in Manhattan in the 1850s, there were perhaps five or six dispensaries like this one, um, each catering to its own neighborhood. And they were early public health institutions. They were places where the poor could get free simple remedies and um, where young doctors in training could get their first practical experience. So Elizabeth found a single room on East 7th Street near Tompkins Square in the middle of Little Germany and she established a small dispensary for indigent women and children uh, who could come to her for cough syrup. Uh, she also dispensed plenty of advice about hygiene, child care, ventilation, nutrition. Um, she gave out advice about charities, and she was really practicing social work as much as she was medicine. Um, another way that her work was orienting itself more toward public health. Um, meanwhile, her sister Emily, right? What happened to Emily? Emily, five years younger than Elizabeth, was, um, after Elizabeth, the most capable of the Blackwell clan. Um, the Blackwells were quite clannish, and Elizabeth knew that she wanted sort of a partner, a companion in this lonely pursuit that she had chosen, and um, she didn't have uh, a very high regard for people who were outside of her family, so she chose the most talented member of it uh, and instructed Emily to study medicine, and Emily amazingly did, um, although she had a harder, an even harder time finding her way to a medical degree than Elizabeth had. Um, the medical establishment was horrified by Elizabeth Blackwell's success at medical school, and so in the wake of that, medical schools had clanged shut against women. Um, Emily Blackwell was rejected by Virginia Geneva College, despite the fact that her sister had been first in the class. Um, she struggled, got had as many rejections at as many medical schools as her sister had, and finally convinced Rush College in Chicago to admit her. Um, she had an ecstatic first term of study, um, made many mentors, impressed many people, but not enough because at the end of that term, um, Rush said, actually, we're very uncomfortable having a woman here. Could you please not come back? We are not going to give you a degree. Um, so she scrambled and found her way to Cleveland Medical College, uh, which is now part of Case Western, and finished her medical degree there. She was nothing if not determined. Uh, like her sister, though, she emerged from medical school with very little practical experience at all. Um, so off she went to Edinburgh, where she became one of the assistants of Sir James Young Simpson, um, a larger than life, clearly larger than life, um, figure in the Edinburgh medical, medical establishment. Ed Edinburgh was one of the centers of medical education. Um, he was the chair of obstetrics and gynecology at the university. He was the physician to the queen. He was the discoverer of the anesthetic properties of chloroform. Um, he discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform by inviting his friends to his dining table and passing around a decanter of chloroform, which all inhaled, whereupon they all burst into hysterical laughter and collapsed under the table. So that was something of James Young Simpson. I had a lot of fun going to Edinburgh and following in Emily's footsteps. James Young Simpson's house is on Queen Street in the New Town. Um, it's the only one in the row with an extra story because his family, his practice, and his circle of friends just couldn't fit in a regular sized house. Um, he was remarkably re respectful of Emily and her talents, um, but he, it's hard not to suspect that he also kind of enjoyed her presence uh, in his 
capacity as a showman. Uh, having a, a female doctor to show off was kind of fun, and I think it amused him and his colleagues to have her around, even though they respected her abilities. Um, the measure of his size of his ego, the banisters in his house had his initials worked into, it, into them, I-Y-S, the Latinized initials of James Young Simpson. Uh, Emily, in, in Simpson's presence, learned a lot about gyne the leading edge of gynecology, watching him with his rather wealthy patients. Meanwhile, she was also living in a small maternity hospital in the Old Town, which was um, the, the area of the poor, um, and going to into people's homes to help deliver babies and learning, making her own connections between, um, between poverty and disease. So she went on to study in Paris and then finally joined Elizabeth in New York in 1856. And in 1857, they were able to together found the infirmary um, for indigent women and children in this building. This is the view from Bleecker Street. This is what it looks like from Crosby. Um, the New York Infirmary was interesting. It was both an inpatient hospital and a public health center. Uh, they created the role of sanitary visitor, they called it, um, that the, the female physicians who worked there along with the young female medical graduates who were training would go out into the neighborhood and uh, do some of that dispensary work, that, that, that social work, public health work, talking about hygiene to the women of the area, um, it was at once good public relations for the idea of women doctors, which was still an outrageous idea for most people. Um, it was important practical experience for the young medical graduates, and it kept costs down at the hospital because it's cheaper not to have to feed an inpatient than to go visit someone in their home. Um, interestingly, one of these sanitary visitors was a recent female medical graduate named Rebecca Cole. Rebecca Cole was the second African-American woman to receive a medical degree. Um, that, oh, I'm sorry. Um, we're going to skip to Rebecca Cole. Oops. Um, Rebecca Cole um, did that work alongside the Blackwells. And um, uh, Village Preservation just did a blog post about her. She's fascinating in herself. And it says a lot about, I think, a, a lot about Elizabeth and Emily that they uh, welcomed her along to work alongside them without much fanfare or comment, where a lot of people in, in their era uh, and in their shoes might, have, um, might not have been so nonchalant about working alongside a black woman. I want to pause on the building here, um, sorry, um, to, uh, to thank Village Preservation again, because in the context of that plaque ceremony in 2018, um, I was able to uh, be introduced by Village Preservation to Jill Plattner, who is one of the owners of the building at Bleecker and Crosby and has lived there um, since the early 90s. Jill is an extraordinary Soho jewelry designer and sculptor um, and became fascinated with the Blackwell story uh, shortly after realizing that her building was part of it. Um, she even named one of her jewelry collections Blackwell. And in fact, in this picture, she's wearing a Blackwell pendant. Um, at the plaque unveiling, she even had t-shirts made with the, with the pendant and Elizabeth Blackwell, original gangster of women doctors, um, proceeds to benefit Planned Parenthood um, that were sold that night. Um, Jill was unbelievably generous to me um, when she discovered what I was working on. She even invited me to write the chapter on the infirmary sitting at her kitchen table uh, among the ghosts in that building. Um, she is pouring love and energy into renovating and restoring the building, um, re-envisioning it as a center of, um, of women-centered business, sort of um, in honor of the Blackwell legacy. And uh, because I know village preservation people like to see inside old buildings, here's what some of the renovation looks like. This is the second floor. This would have been a hospital ward when the Blackwells were in the building. Um, you get a sense of the scale of the building. The ceilings are really high, huge casement windows that would have flooded this hospital ward with light. Um, hearths in all four corners. You can see one of them there on the left. Um, here's another one of the hearths. Um, I was so grateful and moved to be able to be inside this building to really see um, not just the antiquity of it, but feel the people who had moved through it. It was really, really exciting. Um, 
the coal. So the the um, the Blackwells did not stay long at Bleecker and Crosby, only a couple of years, uh, and then they needed to move to bigger quarters. So they moved the infirmary and their living quarters together to uh, Second Avenue between Seventh and Eighth. Um, and it was here that they were when the Civil War broke out. And this was their next big moment in the field of public health. Um, when the Civil War began, there was a chaotic upwelling of energy from, especially from Union women who wanted to support their men who were going off to fight. Um, and it was very unfocused. So, you know, women were racing down to Washington to present themselves as nurses, even though they had no training. People were shipping off food and vegetables and supplies that weren't totally relevant um, for the forces at the front, and, and it was a mess. Um, Elizabeth and Emily recognized this and they called a meeting at this new infirmary building of theirs, to which many of the women and some of the men who supported their projects um, came. Uh, and at that meeting, they drafted an appeal that ran in the New York Times to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army, they wrote. And so this was sort of an open letter ran in the New York Times and called for all women who wanted to help to attend a meeting that would be held at Cooper Union. Cooper Union is still very much looking like this in Union Square. I mean, sorry, in Cooper Square. Um, they would come to a meeting where they would discuss organizing relief efforts among women for the Union soldiers. And the next day, uh, something like 3,000 women came to the Great Hall of Cooper Union. Um, there was a parade of speakers, including Lincoln's vice president, Hannibal Hamlin. And out of this meeting uh, emerged an organization called the Women's Central Association of Relief. And it was, its mandate was to collect and store and distribute material and personnel for the comfort and the health of soldiers. Um, the Blackwells were in charge of the committee to select and train nurses. Um, and this was really a culmination of, of the idea that um, women could do anything men could, they could work alongside men for the raising up of humanity. It was, it was, it was a pretty triumphant moment. And Elizabeth and Emily were in charge of vetting women. They had to be over 30, they had to be soberly dressed, none of the poop skirts that you can see in this engraving. Um, they had to be amenable to taking orders, and they would choose the likely candidates and have them trained at New York area hospitals before they would send them to Washington for deployment to wherever they were needed. Um, it should have been a real um, high watermark for their careers. Instead, it was quite disappointing because their New York infirmary was excluded from the list of hospitals at which these nursing recruits could be trained. It became abundantly and quickly clear that New York's male medical establishment was not ready to work alongside female physicians. Um, and even as the Women's Central Association of Relief grew into the US Sanitary Commission, the largest public health undertaking this country had yet seen, um, the Black Wolf increasingly felt excluded. Uh, to make matters worse, the chief female leadership role went to Dorothea Dix, um, a woman for whom neither of them had any respect at all. She was not um, a trained med doctor or nurse, and, and she'd had no medical training. Um, she was a lobbyist and an organizer. And um, they were deeply disappointed not to have been recognized more for their credentials as well as their efforts. So after they had spent a year working for the Women's Central Association of Relief and recruiting and training 100 nurses, they um, stopped and walked away from the organization and spent the rest of the war looking beyond it to their next project. Um, the Blackwell's next project was the founding of a women's medical college. Um, they had never intended to found a women's medical college. They had assumed that their work um, their struggle to be admitted to, um, to, to regular men's medical colleges and their successes there would have opened those schools to other women. And of course, the opposite had happened. Not only had men's schools shut themselves more and more firmly against women, but a couple of women's medical colleges had opened so that from that point on, if a woman said, I'd like to study medicine, the men's colleges could say, okay, go to the women's colleges and study there. Don't come to us. You don't need to come to us. 
there are schools for you. Um, but in the Blackwell's opinion, the women's medical colleges, the most prominent ones were in Boston and Philadelphia, were woefully inferior and they were training women to be mediocre when in fact women needed a medical education that was at least as rigorous as men's in order to prove themselves. They, they had nothing but scorn for these women's medical colleges. But women weren't getting anywhere in studying alongside men. They, they just couldn't. So in the end, they finally said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll found our own women's medical college and it will be much more rigorous than any of the men. And that's what they did. Um, it, would, it had a longer curriculum. It had a lot more focus on practical instruction and not just lecture. Um, they invited prominent male colleagues to be independent examiners when their students needed to pass their examinations. Stephen Smith was actually one of Elizabeth Blackwell's classmates back in Gene at Geneva College. He went on to be one of the founders of the New York City Board of Health. And he was one of the examiners of the Blackwell College's students and was very impressed by them. Um, even though they built their infirmary and their women's medical college together, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell disagreed among themselves about the true role of, of a woman as a doctor. Um, once their basic goal that was achieved, that here was um, uh, proof that women can be doctors, here is a place for them to study and practice, we founded them. Um, they parted ways and they spent the last 40 years of their lives on different continents. Um, my book focuses on the work they did together, but there was a lot of life that they lived apart. Uh, even before the first women's medical college class had graduated in 1870, Elizabeth returned to England, which she had always preferred to America. Uh, and for the next 40 years, she worked mostly in the fields of public health and moral reform. Um, in London, she helped found the National Health Society uh, with its motto, prevention is better than cure, promoting sanitary practice. Um, she was active in many organizations that promoted moral reform, the fight against promiscuity and sexually transmitted diseases, um, upright sexual conduct. Uh, she held honorary positions at a women, the, the first women's medical college and women's hospital in London, but she devoted her life much more to writing and speaking than to seeing patients. She really came to believe over time that the role, the proper role of a female physician was as a teacher armed with science. Emily, meanwhile, stayed in New York and ran the Women's Medical College and the New York Infirmary for the next several decades. And she did it extremely well. She believed that the proper role of a female physician was to be just as skilled a practitioner as her male colleagues. Um, those colleagues came to deeply respect her work and the quality of the students that she trained. Um, ironically, her work at the institution founded uh, co-founded by her sister, um, served to preserve Elizabeth Blackwell's legacy, which eventually eclipsed Emily's. Um, people haven't heard of Emily, even if they've heard of Elizabeth. Uh, someone asked me recently, what do you think the Blackwell sisters would think about where we are now in this pandemic? Um, and I think they would come out in slightly different places. Elizabeth was really reluctant to accept the emerging science of germ theory, which emerged in the middle of her career. Um, she really, the thought that epidemic disease might be amoral, uh, blamed on a microbe that didn't care whether you were a good person or not, um, that was hard for her to embrace. Emily was always more pragmatic, more interested in hard science, um, and had maybe a more modern understanding of disease. Um, I imagine that if they were here today, uh, Elizabeth would be focusing on prevention, doing webinars about social distancing and hand washing, um, and Emily would be, you know, getting her hospital ready for the onslaught of cases and showing her students how to hook two patients up to one ventilator. Um, they were they were different, but they were both very much the product of their age. Um, the mid nineteenth century was this extraordinary moment, both for scientific advance and for the role of the changing role of women. Um, so those, those waves of change were instrumental in how they directed themselves within the medical field. Um, it's interesting to think about how they would react today, but I think it's also interesting to think about how people today 
um, how the young people who are thinking about entering medicine today uh, will be shaped by what we're all going through. So still relevant uh, and always will be. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I am going to uh, open up my little Q&A window and see if we have any questions. Um, I really appreciate your attention. So let's see. Um, uh, take me a minute to look at what we've got here. Um, Oh, uh, somebody's mentioning um, a novel called The Gilded Hour uh, by a woman named Sarah Donati um, that's about um, women doctors in the 1880s in New York. Um, and I read that book, it's, it's very entertaining. Um, could she have based her inter information on these two ladies? Yes, I think she based it on, on them and others. Um, I've, I've left out a lot of people um, from this story. Um, there was a constellation of women um, many of whom passed through the New York infirmary, people like Mary Putnam Jacoby, Sophia Jex Blake, um, uh, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson never was in England, but definitely interacted with the Blackwells. All of these pioneering women doctors would have been people that, um, that, that, that made up some people in that, in that uh, historical novel. It's a fun one. Um, let's see. Um, there were two black women doctors in New York in the early 1900s. Do you know about them? Um, uh, I, I, I'm not as well versed in the history of black medical education as I should be. Um, Rebecca Cole was the second woman, uh, black woman to become a doctor. The first was Rebecca Crumpler. Um, uh, and there was a third one whose name escapes me, who was also uh, a New Yorker. Um, let's see. Um, both sisters are celebrated at New York Presbyterian's Lower Manhattan Campus, which is the successor to this dispensary. That's right. Um, their portraits hang in the hospital, and we have some fascinating artifacts, including their desks. That's true. This is coming from Geraldine McGinty at um, Downtown Hospital. I actually went and visited the writing desk of Elizabeth Blackwell. Um, it's a very cool artifact to see there, a portable writing desk that opens up. You can see some of the physical culture of her life. Um, let's see. How did they finance the dispensary in the college? Good question. Um, donations. They realized um, early on that um, uh, being a woman doctor was not going to be just about learning physiology and anatomy. Um, it was also going to be about fundraising, which they both loathed. Um, they were really not very good at PR. That was Florence Nightingale. She was the famous one. Um, uh, but they managed to cultivate relationships with mostly powerful men and many of their wives. Um, and eventually there was an endowment that financed the Women's Medical College. What is the relationship to Blackwell's Island? Uh, none, <laughs> unfortunately. Blackwell's Island, which is what Roosevelt Island used to be called, um, is named for the Blackwells who farmed there in the 17th century. Um, there's, no, there's no link there. Um, Blackwell's not that uncommon a name. Let's see. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble scrolling here. Okay. Um, was there something that precipitated, oh, by the way, I should say, um, I'm happy to stay and answer questions for as long as anyone wants to listen. So um, um, I'll try to get to all of them. And please, if, if, uh, if dinner is calling, um, off you go. Um, was there something that precipitated the break with Elizabeth moving back to England? Um, Elizabeth had always wanted to move back to England at different moments uh, when she was training there at St. Bartholomew's and then on an extended sojourn there around 1859. She toyed with the idea of giving it up in New York and just being in England and being a doctor there. Um, I think the foundation of the college, which was sort of the pinnacle of their intent to, um, to create a legacy for women's medical education, kind of made her feel like okay, we've made this thing. My sister Emily is much better than I am at running it. I'm out of here. Um, I think that the break was, was, was not uh, sudden, but it, was, it had been growing for a long time. Um, let's see. Um, 
the excerpt oh, about someone's asking the excerpts from letters were very interesting. Did their family preserve them or did they leave their papers to some kind of archive? Um, I think uh, in the 19th century, you know, the, the, there were nine Blackwell siblings who both um, who were both very clannish and drove each other all a little nuts. So they spent a lot of time writing to each other and not actually living near each other. <laughs> um, so there were thousands and thousands and thousands of letters, um, mostly at the Schlesinger Library and at the Library of Congress and in several other places as well. But in the 19th century, people held on to these letters. Um, they were, you know, in the same way that, you know, we archive our emails, um, you didn't just pitch letters, especially when, like Elizabeth, you thought of yourself as creating a legacy. Um, you held on to things. Interestingly, there's a lot more um, in Elizabeth's writing and preserved by her than Emily, that one of the challenges of writing this book was that there was a lot more depth of material about Elizabeth than about Emily, um, which made it a bit of a challenge sometimes to um, write a double biography. Um, let's see, did either Blackwell become interested in politics? What would they think of the suffragettes movement? That's a good question. Interestingly, two of their brothers, even though none of the Blackwell sisters were married, um, two of their brothers married two of the most prominent feminists of the era. Their brother Henry married Lucy Stone, um, who was uh, a very prominent voice for women's, for, for, the, for women's voting rights. And their brother Samuel married Antoinette Brown, who was the first ordained minister to be a woman. Um, they really disagreed with their sisters-in-law. <laughs> they had nothing nice to say about women's suffrage. They thought, that it was ridiculous to give women the vote before they were enlightened and educated enough to know what to do with it. Um, so they thought it was important for women to emancipate themselves um, before they had the vote bestowed on them. Um, there's a lot of juicy and rather um, snarly material <laughs> of Elizabeth especially um, criticizing the women's suffrage movement. Um, it's a complicated story. Uh, did either sister first consider becoming a lawyer? Um, no, uh, not because they weren't intelligent. Um, I think, uh, interestingly, there was even, you need to have at least a little bit of a precedent for pursuing something. And even though there was no such thing as a respectable female physician, there were plenty of respectable midwives. Um, women had always practiced the healing arts. And even if you know professional male doctors were now pushing them aside, there was always a sense that medicine was something women could do and do well, in fact, maybe even better than men. Um, so that, I think, uh, drew them in a little bit more. There was really, in 1845, no such thing as a female lawyer to even think about looking toward. Let's see. Um, um, for how long were marriage and a career as a doctor for a woman mutually exclusive? Um, well, uh, it's arguable that they weren't. Um, Mary Putnam Jacoby, that I mentioned quickly, um, was one of the most prominent female physicians of the late 19th century. She was Elizabeth and Emily's student first. And then when she finished her training, she married Abraham Jacoby, who was a very prominent pediatrician. Um, they had an extraordinary um, double career in medicine. Um, Florence Nightingale, on the other hand, believed that um, in order to be a female doctor, you must be celibate. There was no other way. Um, so the, I, think, <laughs> I think the reason that they weren't, compa weren't considered compatible for a long time is that there weren't a lot of men who were willing to consider having a wife with a career. Um, I think, sadly, that's probably the root of it. Let's see. I feel like I might be missing things in here. Um, um, I'm curious about the role of religion in their work, goals, and leadership. Um, yeah, it, it, it played a big role, especially for Elizabeth. Um, they, she especially was a, was a spiritual person. She didn't adhere to any specific church, but she had been deeply interested in 
um, a whole range of faiths. Um, she sort of swung from um, Episcopalianism to Unitarianism, and sort of seeking in her youth and um, read a lot of Channing, um, followed the Transcendentalists a little bit, um, and sort of settled on uh, a more personal faith that wasn't particularly institutional, um, where she really kind of believed that she was doing God's work and she and God had kind of a personal thing. <laughs> um, at one point she, uh, she, 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 she said, I was so grateful for being um, accepted at Geneva College that I wanted to bless God. I wanted to throw my arms around him and, and mend his socks or do something to help him out. Um, she had a very um, clear and kind of startling sense that um, she and God were colleagues. <laughs> um, but any, um, uh, you know, any physician in, in, in the era before drugs really were particularly effective knew that God was a very important part of the pharmacopoeia. Um, if <laughs> you needed to have God on your side, otherwise, um, you know, when your medicines didn't work, at least you could pray. Um, why do you think Elizabeth's legacy has eclipsed that of Emily's? Um, well, partly there's the first thing. People like a first, um, and she was first. Emily was third. Um, that, of course, begs the question of who was second, but for that, you're going to have to read the book. Um, also, um, Emily was just a much more understated person. She really believed in the cause, but didn't need any acclaim. Um, she did not leave a huge body of her own writing the way Elizabeth did. Um, she was very content to be excellent um, and let the work speak for itself. Um, when the Women's Medical College um, had in, had lasted for about 30 years, when um, schools like Johns Hopkins and Cornell began to accept women, she decided to close the, 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 the Women's Medical College that she had helped found and run um, because it wasn't necessary anymore. The, the, the journey was, was, was complete. Women were now accepted at, at, at male medical schools to a certain extent and would continue to be. Um, she didn't need to, um, her ego was not bound up in running that college. She felt like the work was done and now she could stop. Um, so I think, uh, I don't think she would have minded that Elizabeth, that Elizabeth's reputation was the lasting one. That's sort of how she lived. Um, I minded because I fell in love with Emily too, and I wanted to make sure that this that this story was told as a story of, of both of them. Because um, I don't think Elizabeth would Elizabeth's legacy would have been as large without the support that her sister gave her. Um, can you comment more about why Elizabeth and all of her sisters never married? Um, that must have been extraordinary at the time. Yeah, it, 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 to a certain extent, I mean, to have five sisters in one family not get married, that was extraordinary. Um, it wasn't quite as extraordinary for, you know, one female family member to be the kind of hearth tender um, caregiver, elder care person. Um, but I do think that um, the example of their father uh, not being someone who ended up supporting the family reliably was formative. Um, they all, um, in, in the wake of his death, um, the, th the three oldest children were girls and immediately opened a school to help keep the family afloat. Um, they, so they had an early orientation toward professional pursuits um, and really didn't think much of depending on a man since their own father who they loved um, had really let them down. So they, they, they early thought about pursuing um, sustaining careers that would not depend on a man. Um, let's see, could you talk a little bit about Dr. Marie Zakshevska? Yes, and I'm sorry, Dr. Marie, that I've left you out of, of tonight's talk. Marie Zakshevska um, came uh, from Poland and grew up in Berlin, um, and she met Elizabeth uh, while Emily was still in training. Uh, she was another another very very talented woman in the medical field, and along with 
um, Elizabeth and Emily helped to found the infirmary at Bleecker and Crosby. Um, she was their resident physician. The, the sisters founded the hospital, and um, Marie Zakshevska was the um, was the the the, physi the female physician who actually lived in the building. She lived in the attic. Um, she went on to part ways with them. She was just as strong a character as they were and really couldn't stand to um, be subordinate to them. And she went on to a, a very prominent medical career in Boston at the Female Medical College in Boston. Um, let's see, maybe I'll do a mm, couple more. I don't want to keep everybody from their dinner. Um, what did the other unmarried sisters do? Uh, well, let's see, there were three of them. Anna was the oldest. She was a journalist and a translator. She actually translated George Eliot. I'm sorry, George Sand. Um, and uh, and uh, other French thinkers. Um, she was a bit of a drama queen um, and kind of the, the, the family chronicler at a very heightened level. Um, Marion was the second daughter who basically stayed home and looked after everybody. And the youngest was Ellen, who studied painting. She actually studied painting with people like Rosa Bunner and Ruskin. Um, it was an extraordinary family. Um, let's see. Um, what was the eventual fate of the Blackwell's infirmary? Well, it, 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 pers it, it, it went on and on um, until 1981. It um, it was the, the the infirmary for women and children. Uh, then it merged with um, downtown hospital. Uh, it, it's a complicated lineage because all the hospitals are always merging and converging. But um, now it is it, it, its present incarnation is part of downtown hospital. Um, which is in, in the financial district. So it, it sort of still exists. Um, the women's college closed, but the infirmary went on. Um, can you repeat Elizabeth Blackwell's connection to the Northern Dispensary? She didn't have one. I'm sorry if that was misleading. Um, she, I just put that slide up because it's an actual slide of an actual dispensary, but um, Elizabeth's dispensary uh, was different. It was a single room only for women over in the East Village on 7th Street. Um, Oh, also, if she didn't agree with germ theory, how did she explain losing her eye? That is a really good question. I'm not sure what the answer is in her mind. Um, perhaps she felt that, um, uh, well, it's interesting actually, because uh, when she was recovering, her sister Anna, who happened also to be in Paris and was helping her with convalescence, wrote a letter that probably explains what she and Elizabeth thought about why she was she had lost her eye. Um, she Anna wrote in description that um, how horrifying it was that um, that Elizabeth should suffer for the sins of the people that she was looking after. Um, there was a sort of weird overlay of of Christ on that, um, but there was definitely a sense not not. She under, there, there was an understanding that the proximity to, the, to, the, to this infected child had caused the infection, but why it had actually taken hold and done damage had more to do with this sense of, of someone had to pay for sin. Um, it's really quite striking. Let's see. Um, let's see. It's, um, it's 7.40. Maybe I'll just keep, I'll just keep going then. Um, let's see. The Women's Medical Center of the New York, the, the College of the New York Infirmary uh, merged with Cornell. Did either sister have a role in the start of Cornell Med? So what, what really happened there was that um, Cornell founded its medical department in New York City, even though Cornell was in Ithaca, um, in 1897 and immediately began to accept women. Um, when Emily Blackwell made the decision to close the Women's Medical College, she instructed her current students to finish up at Cornell. Um, the institutions didn't merge, but the students who hadn't gotten their degrees yet with Emily went over to Cornell and got them there. Um, so there was not an institutional um, merger. Um, let me see, did I answer the question? Um, 
anyway. Um, will this recording be available? Yes, I believe that this is being recorded and that it eventually will be on YouTube. Ariel will probably be able to tell you more. Um, um, let's see, did I get everybody? Um, was there one place that you did most of your research? Um, again, there were more than 100,000 art items at the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe. There was another sort of 30,000 pieces of the Library of Congress. And then I like, I like to go and walk in the footsteps of my subject. So I was in Edinburgh and in London and in Bristol and in Paris um, and in Geneva. Um, those were wonderful trips. Uh, and I found new information in all of those places. Um, let me see if I got any information on the careers of the women who studied with them. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, they're, 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 each of them deserves their own book, but uh, I do, I, prominent cameos in my book go to Marie Zakshevska, um, Mary Putnam Jacoby, uh, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was the first woman doctor in England, uh, Sophia Jex Blake, who uh, was one of the Edinburgh Seven, if you know that whole story. Um, there's a lot of, of that. Um, let's see. Uh, Did Emily finish her career at the second location of the infirmary? She finished her career at the third location of the infirmary, which was um, over on Livingston Square. Um, they eventually moved both, both the infirmary and the college needed to be bigger. So they moved them together over there. Um, uh, was it unusual for Blackwell to adopt a child as a single woman? Um, I'm fascinated that this was allowed. Was it the child of someone she knew? Um, yeah, somebody knows this story better better than than what I what I told you. Um, yeah, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell both adopted little girls, um, uh, and I think it wasn't entirely unusual at the time. Um, it also wasn't entirely official. Uh, I don't think either of them officially adopted, legally adopted these children. Um, in Elizabeth's case, she was lonely. Um, she was back in New York. Uh, patients weren't coming. She had no partner. Um, and so she went to the, um, the nurseries on Randall's Island. This was a, a, you know, an asylum for abandoned children, essentially, and picked out a child. Um, this was often what people did when they wanted some help around the house. She had an idea of uh, bringing a child into her life as a sort of a combination of ward and daughter and servant, which is, and, and um, so she brought home a little girl named Kitty um, who became her amanuensis really for her entire life. This young woman um, never married and always was completely loyal to Elizabeth. Um, Emily also adopted a daughter, um, in a more sort of traditional mother-daughter kind of way. This was a, a young woman who grew up in a more um, conventional way, married, gave Emily grandchildren. Um, Emily herself had a partner where Elizabeth never did. Emily lived with Elizabeth Cushier, another uh, fellow woman physician uh, for the last 30 years of her life and had a very sort of happy domestic relationship with her. Um, What led you to this topic as your latest book topic? Um, yeah, it's a bit of a departure from my last one, which was about 19th century Japan. <laughs> but um, I think, as I think I've said before to some of you, um, you can't do the work of writing a whole book about people unless you really are in love with the story. And it has to connect to something inside of you. Um, the Japan story did connect to something inside of me as far as my relationship to my um, in-laws in Japan and my study of 19th century Japanese history. Um, this one, um, I started college pre-med and, um, and medicine was sort of the path not taken. Uh, about five years ago, I encountered the Blackwells for the first time and I was astonished and appalled that I had never heard of them. I grew up at a proudly feminist all-girls school in Manhattan 
in the city where they had practiced. And I graduated from that school, you know, being the math science kid, and I had never heard of them. I couldn't believe it. So clearly it was a story that needed telling. All right. Um, I think I've gone through most of these. I really appreciate. Um, oh, I, here's one, one last one. Here's the last one. Um, did the Blackwells find that France and England or other European countries ultimately moved ahead more quickly than the United States in terms of advancing women in medicine in the later part of the 19th century? I think actually America did better in that regard. Um, part of the reason they didn't immediately move back to London was that they knew that America was a better place to smash taboos. Um, the idea of women studying medicine was advancing more quickly there. Um, uh, so that's why they stayed as long as they did, and in Emily's case, for the rest of her life. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, it's very weird to be not able to um, say thank you and, and wave at you each in person, but thank you all for, for being here and listening. Um, this was a great treat for me. And also for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Take good care. Thanks to everybody who...